glad that you are here. It is Palm Sunday, and we're going to have a wonderful, beautiful worship service this morning. Let's stand together and open our service in song. Palm Sunday to each and every one of you. This morning we are singing about how Jesus is the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, and we're celebrating that day when he entered J Jerusalem to cheering crowds, uh, shouting Hosanna in the highest, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Today is the beginning of a very special week in the life of the church. It's the beginning of Holy Week, and as such we have a lot going on this week. So I want to spend just a couple of minutes reminding you of what we have happening this week. Uh, 
first, let me just say, if you've seen anybody around here that seems particularly sore in the arms or the knees, thank you to those of you who came and helped at yesterday's work day. I think we climbed those stairs up to the balcony roughly 30 times a piece. And so thank you to each and every one of you who came to that yesterday. We got a lot done in preparation for our sanctuary renovation here in a little bit. Uh, and so thank you to those who helped out. As for this week, there's more help to give starting tonight uh, from 4 o'clock to 6 o'clock. We are having our Easter Fest. This is an activity for our kids and our young families in particular. It's an opportunity for them to kind of walk through the story of Holy Week ending in Easter. Um, we'll have some interactive activities for the kids. And two things that have changed since last Sunday that I want to make sure you know about. One is that we will be doing this in Davis Hall rather than outdoors. Um, we have a wind advisory today, and we don't want those arts and crafts blowing all over the place. So it'll be in Davis Hall, not outside today. That being said, if you have volunteered to bring one of those pop-up tents, we are still going to use those to kind of mark where each station is. So if you have volunteered to bring one of those, we still want your pop-up tent. And hope to see each and every one of you today at 4 o'clock for Easter Fest to support those kids and those families um, and begin our Holy Week together. The next time that we will be convening for a special service is on Thursday night for our annual Maundy Thursday service. This is commemorating that night in the upper room when Jesus did two things with his disciples. He took the Last Supper to let them know what was about to happen, how he was about to give his body and his blood on their behalf. And then he washed the feet of the disciples, this act of servant leadership and this act of love. And so we'll be commemorating both of those things in that Maundy Thursday service, both taking the Lord's Supper and we will have a time of foot washing for those who choose to take part in that. It is optional. I know it's awkward, but it's also extremely meaningful for those who take part. So that'll be this Thursday night at seven o'clock. The next day we come together again at seven o'clock for a special Good Friday service as we mark the death of Jesus on the cross where he paid it all for us and gave his life so that uh, our sins could be atoned for. So join us for that Good Friday service at 7. Nothing on Saturday. Saturday, do stuff with your family. Um, uh, enjoy that time with them. And then on Sunday, we'll be meeting over at Eastern Hills Park over on Country Club at 6.30 in the morning for a sunrise service a brief time of worship out there on the basketball court, and we'll watch the sunrise together, and we will celebrate Easter with one another. Come back here at 9 o'clock. All the adults are together for Sunday school in Davis Hall. Um, Larry Davis, my predecessor as pastor, will be bringing a special uh, lesson for all of the adults at 9 o'clock, and then we'll come back here in the sanctuary at 1030 for worship together. A lot going on this week. You don't have to remember all of that. It's all here in your bulletin. Um, but I hope that you'll join us for these special services, these special times together as we commemorate the events of Holy Week together. As I said, today is Palm Sunday. Today we celebrate that Jesus is King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And so Holy Week begins now as we crown him with many crowns. And so as we continue in our worship, what I want to do now is invite the kids here in the service to come down and join me here at the front and I've got a special message just for y'all. Come on, kids, come and join me at the front. Hello, everybody. Come on down. Yeah, I'm going to sit down right down here with you, okay? All right. So I was telling everybody just a second ago that today's a really special day. It's called Palm Sunday. You see those plants back there? Not the white flowers, but the plants underneath the stained glass window. Those are palm branches. And the reason that those are up today is because a long time ago, Jesus entered a big city called Jerusalem. Jerusalem's where the temple was, where people went to go worship. And Jesus entered Jerusalem. And when he did, there were crowds of people there, lots and lots of people and they were so excited Jesus was coming because when they saw Jesus, they saw somebody really special. Somebody who might wear something like this. What, what is this? A crown. a crown. Who would wear a crown? Jesus. Jesus, yes, okay. A, a king would? A king or a queen? A crown. 
And when the people saw Jesus, they saw somebody who they thought would be wearing one of these very, very soon. They saw somebody who they thought, he's going to be somebody who will lead our country. He'll be somebody who might lead us into battle. He'll be somebody who will be rich and famous and powerful. And he'll be a king who would wear a crown. And so that's why they greeted him. That's why they welcomed him when he came into the city. But then something strange happened. Before the week was even over, everybody had kind of changed their mind. Because Jesus didn't really seem like the kind of king they thought he would be. He wasn't raising up an army. He wasn't battling their enemies. He just, he didn't seem like the kind of king they were expecting. And by the end of the week, Jesus had died on the cross. But here's what's really special. The people on that Sunday who welcomed Jesus, who thought he was a king who might wear a crown like this, they didn't really understand, but they were actually right. Jesus is a king, and he proved that on Easter Sunday when he rose from the dead. See, Jesus isn't a king like we might expect on earth. He's not a king who acquires a lot of riches. He's not a king who leads armies into battle, but kind of like we'll be singing in the service, he's the king of our hearts, and he's the king of all the kings, the Lord of all the lords. He's the very son of God. Jesus is a king who came to free us from sin and from death. Jesus is a king who is the son of God and the Messiah, the one sent by God to save us. And that's what we celebrate this week, that Jesus came, and he may not have been the kind of king we were expecting, but he was even better than what we expected. So I'm going to say a prayer, and then we'll go back to our parents, okay? Dear God, thank you for today. Thank you for these kids. And thank you, Lord, that so long ago, you sent your son to live and die and rise again so that we could be saved from our sins. Lord, you weren't the kind of savior we expected. You weren't the kind of king we anticipated. But nevertheless, you are the king of all kings, the Lord of all lords. And we praise you for that. So be with us now as we worship. And I pray that we would remember just what kind of king you are. It's in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen. All right, let's go back. We're going to continue to sing that message in music that the children just learned that he is the King of King and Lord of Lords, and we've already sung those words. We lift our banner high. We lift the name of Jesus from age to age you reign. Your kingdom has no end. And I can just hear those words as he made the triumphal entry on Palm Sunday. Let's stand together and continue our music. Crown him with many crowns.
Today from John chapter, <clears throat> excuse me, chapter. I'm losing my voice all over the place here. John chapter 19, verse 30. And if the pastor will allow, I'll take two quick steps back. You will remember that Jesus has said, "I am thirsty," and then the soldiers gave him a drink on a sponge. And many versions will say that that is sour wine. I can't imagine that they would do anything better than that with all the other things they've done. And I'm reading with me in beginning in verse 30. When he had received the drink, Jesus said, It is finished. With that, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. What a powerful verse. Join me in prayer, if you will, please. Heavenly Father, we have so many things to be thank thankful for in this life. Through all of our times of trouble and pain and whatever else may have been bestowed on us that wasn't exactly what we thought we wanted, we know you are in control. And we must always remember that. I'm not sure what is the greatest gift you've ever given us, but it may well be Jesus Christ, who you sent here to earth, live and die as a human being, and die such a horrible death. And the reading today was when he said, it is finished. Now at this time in our service is a time where we have the opportunity to return to the Lord's a portion of what we have been bestowed upon us. And we need to do that, I always say, with a thankful heart. This is not something you need to do begrudgingly. If you do it begrudgingly, it loses a lot of its meaning. So always be thankful in heart for what you're able to return to him. Forgive us of all of our many sins and many that we don't 
always remember or know that we have done. For you created the way for sinners like me to have a way to heaven. So it is in Jesus' strong, holy name I pray. Amen.
so thankful to our praise chorale for leading us so beautifully this morning, to our praise team for leading us as well. It's always wonderful when the family of God can come together and be led so beautifully in music by such talented individuals. We're thankful to them for serving the church. We're thankful to them for leading us in our worship this morning. You heard Al read our verse for today, John chapter 19, verse 30, just a moment ago. It's the sixth of Jesus' seven last words from the cross. All throughout this Lenten season, we've been looking at each of these statements that Jesus made from the cross. Seven different times he opened his mouth to speak, sometimes with words of reassurance, sometimes with words about salvation, sometimes with words of brokenness. Like last week when he said, I am thirsty, or the week before when he said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And today we come to the the penultimate, the second to last of these seven words. We'll conclude the series on Friday in that Good Friday service. And today we look at John 19, 30, where Jesus simply says, it is finished. Of all the things that he said from the cross, this feels like the most climactic of them all. This is the one where when we imagine the earthquake that came afterwards, when we imagine the sky darkening in our minds, it's as he says these words, it is finished. This is, where, this is what it's all been building up to, it seems. This is where it all finally happens. It is finished. But, it's worth asking, what exactly it is? What is it that Jesus is saying has been completed by his crucifixion? What is it that's now done through his death? What is it that is being finished by the death of Jesus on the cross? Because typically when you say it's finished, it's done, it's over, you know what it is you're talking about. When an announcer for the Super Bowl says, and that's it, folks, it's all over, you know what he's talking about you know it means that the game has completed. When you're running a race and you cross the finish line, you know what it is you have completed. You know how far it is you've gone, where you started, and where you are now stopping. You know what it is you've completed. So when Jesus says, it is finished, what is he talking about? That's our question for this morning as we look at these three simple words. Words that are simple indeed, but full of profundity. So what's Jesus getting at here? The the natural guess, I would think, when he says, it is finished, and then breathes his last, bows his head and gives up his spirit, as John puts it, the natural guess is to say that he's talking about his life, talking about his earthly ministry, that that is what is now over and done, that Jesus's life has come to an end, a life that began with a virgin giving birth in the little town of Bethlehem, the city of David, a life that continued when Jesus was baptized in the Jordan River, baptized by his forerunner, by that Elijah come again named John the Baptist. As the Holy Spirit descended on him like a dove and a voice from heaven proclaimed God's approval for Jesus. A life that continued with miracle after miracle after miracle, healing after healing after healing. A life full of profound and wise teachings that announced to people that the kingdom of God was close at hand and that this is what life in that kingdom looked like. A life where crowds of people came alongside him, where a core group of 12 disciples accompanied him everywhere he went. 
a life that met its crescendo when he entered Jerusalem to cries of Hosanna. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Greeted by the citizens of Jerusalem with palm branches being waved as they would for a conquering king, with cloaks laid down before him, and yet with a hint that Jesus would, as I told the kids, be a different kind of king. Because he rode in not on a stallion, rode in not with an army at his back, but rode in rather on a donkey accompanied only by those 12 disciples. As our week goes on, we'll see specifically what happened over the course of that holy week. We'll talk about the Last Supper. We'll talk about the foot washing. But before those events of Thursday, Jesus got himself in some trouble. Monday, he entered the temple, and what he found there stirred his heart and stirred up a sense of righteous indignation because what he saw was people being taken advantage of by the religious leaders and the temple officials charging the poor to make sacrifices before God exploiting them for the sake of their own pocketbooks And so Jesus drove out these money changers. Jesus drove out these officials and made himself enemies that would soon take his life into their hands. Tuesday, he spent the day teaching. Wednesday, he spent the day teaching. And in his teaching, he took these religious officials to task as he so often had in his three years of ministry, showing all the world that these Religious leaders, so-called, were nothing but hypocrites. People who took the law that had been given to them by God and used it as a way to hurt people instead of to help them. To push people down instead of lift them up. Who took the law of God into their hands and twisted it into something so different from what God ever intended it to be. And so this brings us then to the cross. Because it is there that these religious officials handed Jesus over to the Roman government. It's here that Jesus was hung up to die on an old rugged cross. And it's here that he said word after word, It's here that he took his last breaths, and it is here that he died. For anybody else, anyone else in the history of humanity, for him to say, it is finished in this moment, would clearly be a marker that my life, my ministry, my time here on this earth has drawn to a close. If John the Baptist had said, it is finished, right before he was beheaded, he would have been talking about his life. If Elijah had said it, if Moses had said it, if David had said it, if Abraham had said it, any of these forefathers of the faith, any of these heroes of the Old Testament, if any of them had said, it is finished, and then breathed their last we could safely assume they were talking about their life, their ministry. But not for Jesus. Because Jesus had already told his disciples, not once, not twice, but three different times, that he would be turned over, that he would be crucified, that he would die, And that he would rise again. Jesus knew what was to come on that first Easter Sunday. That which we will celebrate a week from today. Jesus knew 
that the cross was not the end of his story. Jesus knew there was more still to come. That the cross, though a climactic moment to be sure, was not the completion of his story. We have hope today because when Jesus said it is finished, he wasn't talking about his life. Because when we talk about Jesus, we don't say Jesus was, we say Jesus is. Because he is alive today. More on that next week. So, if that's not what he's saying, if that's not what he means, then maybe we need to go further back and think about his relationship with the very people who turned him over to the Romans. When he'd entered Jerusalem on that Palm Sunday, the people were expecting that he was the king of Israel that they'd been promised. That he was going to be David come again. That he was going to be the one that prophets like Isaiah and Micah had said would come. One who would set things right for God's people. One who would deliver them from their oppressors. One who would bring freedom to a people who were not free. That's why they were cheering on Palm Sunday. But then they turned against him over the course of that holy week. Over the course of that week, they decided that he was not who they thought he was. That they needed still to wait a little longer for a Messiah. So maybe when Jesus said, it is finished, what he was referring to was a severing of the bond between God and his people. It's not unimaginable. I mean, you think back to the beginning of that relationship. You take it all the way back to Abraham in Genesis chapter 12. When God called this man then known as Abram, told him to, a go, to go to a land God would show him, and that if he did so, that God would bless him. And you think about how this relationship progressed between the children of Abraham and God, and it is an awfully rocky road. This is a very dysfunctional family we're dealing with here. Time and time and time and time and time again, the people prove themselves to be faithless. Time and time and time and time again, they show their disobedience. Over and over again, they deviate from what God has called them to do. From the very beginning, God had said, you will be my people and I will be your God. From the very beginning, he said that he had called them to be his representatives on this earth. That through them, through Israel, God would end up blessing the whole world. And yet they just can't stick with him. God gives them a promised land, and they manage to foul it up. God gives them a prosperous nation, and they start worshiping idols. They build a temple to God's glory, and then become more obsessed with its riches than with its worship. And even in the days of the prophet, when things look at their most dire, when people are seemingly looking to God for deliverance, when it doesn't come fast enough, they turn to any God they think will listen. So maybe, just maybe, the cross is for the Lord the last straw. Maybe this is where he says, the covenant is done abolished, put away forever. 
Maybe this is where God says once and for all, I cannot deal with this stubborn, stiff-necked people anymore. They have turned over my very son to be killed, and I will have no part of them anymore. Maybe when Jesus says it is finished, he's remarking upon the end of a relationship. That doesn't quite fit either, does it? Because the Apostle Paul reminds us in Romans chapter 8 that there's nothing, not life, nor death, nor angels, nor demons, nor powers, nor principalities, that, that nothing in all of creation can separate us from the love of God. We think back to what God had promised his people in the Old Testament. And he had sworn to them that he would never leave them nor forsake them. That the day would never come when their faithlessness would overcome his faithfulness. And we listen also to the words of Jesus himself. Who in his Sermon on the Mount had said, I did not come to abolish the law and the prophets. I didn't come to get rid of the covenant. I came to fulfill the covenant. To open it up to the world. Jesus was that child of Israel through whom the whole world is now blessed so when jesus said it is finished he wasn't talking about his life for there was more to come he wasn't talking about god's relationship with his people because that relationship was only getting stronger in the wake of the cross what was he talking about for the answer, we have to go much further back than three years. Back way before the Jordan River baptism. We have to go back before the prophets, before David, before Moses, before even Abraham. We have to go all the way back to the beginning. To Genesis 1, 2, and 3. To when God, with a word, brought humanity into existence. Created human beings. Created them to walk with him seemingly for eternity. Gave them this world to tend to. Commanded them only to go forth and multiply and to be stewards of what he had given to them. All that we as human beings had to do was trust in the one who had given us literally everything. But from the beginning, we see that that was just a little too much to ask for. That we got just a little too greedy. That given one simple command, we chose to go our own way. We chose to follow our temptation instead of our God. And Adam and Eve in that garden of Eden betrayed the God who had given them so much, fell victim to the temptations of the enemy. And ever since then, we have reaped the consequences, driven away from the presence of God, separated from him, and in need of salvation from the sin which we brought into the world and the death that followed close behind. Ever since the beginning, we have needed some way to restore this relationship. Some way to come back to God. Some way to be His again 
in the fullness that Adam and Eve had experienced. A lot of things we tried. We tried to be faithful to the law God gave us, but couldn't do it. We tried to obey the commands we'd been given, but we didn't measure up. No matter what we try to do, we fall short of the glory of God. And so God did something amazing. God did something we give thanks for to this very day. God sent his son, sent him not as a conquering king, as a crying infant, sent him not as a royal prince, but as a carpenter's boy, and sent him to show us what God is like. To show us through the miracles that he worked, to show us through the teachings that he gave us, and ultimately to show us on the cross where Jesus gave his life on our behalf, where Jesus suffered and bled and died so that we could be saved. Jesus died on the cross for us. Jesus died on the cross to restore that relationship between God and humanity, to do for us what we could never do for ourselves. And when he breathed his last, he said, it is finished. The work is done. All that needed to happen in order to restore that relationship, in order to bring us back into the presence of the Father, has been done by the life and the death of Jesus Christ. So where does that leave us today? What does that mean for us today? For so many of us, it seems like we didn't hear these words of Jesus. For so many of us, we're still trying to earn God's affections. For so many of us, we make our way through day after day thinking we have to prove ourselves to God, to prove our worthiness to be called his people. For so many of us, we are still trying to earn our way into his presence, to earn our way back into the garden. Church family, hear me and hear me well. It is finished. The work has been done. Jesus has done on the cross all that needed to be done and all that could be done for us to be saved. Our salvation does not come by our actions. Our salvation does not come by anything in and of ourselves. It comes from the sacrificial death of Jesus on the cross 2,000 years ago. All that remains for us is to receive that gift in faith. To receive what God has done for us. To receive that act of grace. To take what's been given to us. God has done the work. It is finished. May we live in the light of that completed work. Pray together. Father God, I thank you for this day. I thank you for the opportunity to worship you today. And Father, I thank you most of all, for sending your son so long ago to complete a work 
that we could never finish on our own. To carry out an action that, that we could never do ourselves. Lord, I thank you for Jesus' death on the cross. I thank you that by it we are saved. And I pray, Lord, that we would receive that salvation in faith. That we would believe in what you have done for us. And that we would receive that gift of grace. I pray, Lord, that you would take away this sense of earning that fills us. This sense that we have to work for our salvation. This sense that what has been freely given must be paid for by us. May we remember that Jesus paid it all on the cross. May we remember that in him it is finished. I pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. The praise team will lead us in just a moment in a song of worship to the king of our hearts, the king of kings and the Lord of lords. But before they begin, I want to issue this invitation to you this morning. If you've never received the gift that has been given, if you've never placed your faith in the one who died for you, and today you want to take that leap of faith, Today, you want to make the decision to follow Jesus. At the end of the service, I'll be right at the back of the sanctuary, ready to talk with you. I would love to have that conversation. I would love to hear about what the Holy Spirit's doing in your heart. If this morning you want to make a different kind of decision to join our church and become a part of this body of believers, Find me right at the back of the sanctuary. I'll be there waiting for you. For the rest of us, our response to worship will be the singing of this song. Let's lift our voices to the one who is the king of our hearts. Let's stand together and let's sing.
for the morning. Let me put in one last plug for Easter Fest tonight at 4 o'clock. Um, I'll remind you that our vision as a church is to be a multi-generational, community-focused family of faith. And it's at events like tonight that all three of those come together. So if you have kids or grandkids, we'd love to see you. And if you don't, we would still love to see you. I can say that personally as a parent of one of the kids who will be there tonight. I would love for all of Catherine's uh, aunts and uncles and grandmothers and grandfathers to be there tonight. Would love to see you this evening at 4 o'clock for Easter Fest as well as for the other events this week. And so as we go now and prepare to be back here tonight at 4, let me leave you with this word of benediction that on that Palm Sunday, as Jesus entered Jerusalem, crowds shouted, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. They knew he was a king, but they didn't know what kind. May we accept Jesus as the king of our hearts, the king of kings, the Lord of lords. May we recognize him and praise him as the one in whom it is finished. And may we go now in peace.